Good morning or good afternoon, whatever it happens to be for you. Welcome to The Deeper Dive. This is a ministry of Bethel Church in Richmond, Washington, where we actually have one church in three campuses, and I've got the three guys with me here. Let's go around once again. We'll start with you, Adam, and just identify yourself, and we'll go around the horn here. Name's Adam Phillips, and primarily at the Richland campus. Our senior pastor. Yes. I'm Matthew. I'm at our West Pasco campus as the interim pastor right now. Mm -hmm. Slipped in somehow. Slipped in. Just use the interim title and just ducked into the room. <laughs> Nobody even noticed. Happy that you're here, man. Glad and to I be think, here. I think West Pasco's happy that you're there, too, from what I hear. They haven't kicked me out yet, so yeah. it's a good start. Yeah. Uh, Brooks <clears throat> out in Prosser, P-Town in the Valley. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, he <laughs> says. <laughs> okay. Oh. Right then. Okay. Yeah. That's what you call it, Dave. You're the one. B town. You're the one yeah, that's calling it. it it does does make it sound good when you put it that way. Yeah. It By is, the way, how long? Is good out there. Brooks, how long have you been yeah. out in the valley now? I feel like you've asked this question before. Have I? Recently. I probably keep forgetting. <laughs> yeah, push it out of my mind. <laughs> no, it's like I think my uh, Bethel anniversary of you just working, hit two years, right? Yeah, yeah. it was just two years. Yeah. Like so, I think this Sunday or last, yeah, not this coming. The last Sunday was my two year. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. See, that's why I'm asking you, because I was like, oh, we got to come up with an anniversary. I just made that up. But Happy right, anniversary, Brooks. Yeah. Thanks. Pretty good. Okay. Hey, um, starting this off, we're actually going to look in Acts chapter 10. Pretty pretty awesome chapter. Mm. Um, does the fact that God is sovereign, does that bother you guys in any way? I actually, quick preface, I was out with, I won't tell you who this was, because he'll probably be listening to this. One of our, he's one of our, He's an awesome leader here at Bethel. We were out having a coffee, and we were talking about our kids and this and that. And he said, he actually said to me, he said, you know, the fact that God is actually sovereign, it really bothers me because mm. I, I'm wondering why doesn't he just mm -hmm. do this or that mm. over here? And why he, allow, he allows this or that over here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So as the fact that he is sovereign, does that bother you? Or is that, what is that to you personally? I think it comforts me and it bothers me at the mm -hmm. same time. How's that? Well, the fact that God's sovereign over all things, and because I know he's for me in Christ, like there's there's hope and comfort knowing that, and as Paul says, like all things will work together for those who love him. And God has the power and the ability to make that happen. And in his sovereignty, he uses, I mean, even something as evil as the cross where Satan and evil mankind think that they're killing God, God like sub subverts it and uses it for good. So I look at my life and the life of the world and think, man, I'm so, I'm so glad that God is sovereign, no matter what I'm going through. But also his sovereignty means that oftentimes I have to ask the question, like, why are you letting me go through this thing that's mm -hmm. painful or hard? Or why are these people going through this thing that's painful or hard? Or because he's sovereign, he can call me to do, <laughs> like he's the king, like he can call me to do anything he wants. And my job is to, ask questions if I need to, to the Lord, but to submit and to follow him. And that's, mm -hmm. it reminds me that I'm small and not sovereign and that's hard. Okay. I think that's a good answer. Uh, there's definitely a comfort that you know that God is in control over mm -hmm. any circumstance. And like, if you ever like feel really powerless in a situation, there's a great comfort in going to someone who actually has power. Uh, I guess for me, I just it, it, it's definitely more of a comfort than a than a bother to me, because I just know sin is reality, hmm. and of course you can get to a whole thing about free will and all that stuff. But like, if, if that is what we have, and He allows us to have sin, uh, there's a mystery there of how how much does He allow? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's kind of that mm -hmm. there's that tension there. But just because I've seen the depravity of sin, I just my tendency is to thank God for His sovereignty, or sin would just run rampant over everything, and there's no no good at all. Mm -hmm. I'd, <clears throat> I'd answer your question with a question. Of what do you mean by sovereignty? Mm -hmm. Nice like Jesus move there. To yeah, the question. Yeah. I'm trying to be more like Jesus and ask more questions. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Socratic method. Yeah. He asked more questions than he answered. Uh, I think that there is like, I'll, I'll use the words from my professor uh, in seminary, uh, Gary Brashears. He says, God can either be 
sovereign, or he can be sovereign. Um, he can either be sovereign with a tight fist and, and heavy handed and controls every single thing, or he can be sovereign and open handedly have everything in his palm. Mm. Um, so I would say it depends on what you mean by sovereign. Um, if it is, if your view of God, I believe, let's say this, this way, I, I, if, if my view of God is a heavy handed, all controlling every jot and tittle, then, um, Sovereignty is a lot, yeah, a lot more frustrating. I mean, following off on that, there are, there are people that go so deep into at least one view of sovereignty that it's like, like I don't, I don't really have free will. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just, right. you know, it's all, it's all determined. Nothing I can change. And <clears throat> yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a machine. Yeah, and that's that would lead to a very frustrating view of sovereignty. Um, mm-hmm. And I would say whatever your view of sovereignty is, it is worth exploring. So are you saying? That there are I don't know what I'm saying certain Adam, details <laughs> like minutia that God is not in control over. Like is that is, or are you saying that like God is so like the version of sovereignty you're not ascribing to is like like the really difficult king who's sort of power hungry and doesn't want people to experience freedom and yeah, I would not ascribe to that view of sovereignty, um, but I would I would. Um, be very slow to to say that God is not in control of everything because Scripture says right. He is. Um, Even the jot and tittles, right? Um, but I, I would I I don't want to think that we are uh, that we have an excuse mm, of our right. actions that we don't are not held responsible or that the sin is not a reality right. in the world. That's okay. I think you can take that view of sovereignty. It's like okay. Therefore, every single thing that happens is by the hand of God. On one hand, yes, that's true. But it, did he really cause the tsunami in India that, that killed thousands of people? Um, or is, is that where it comes like the distinction between like God's – This is, I, I'm trying to think of a simpler way to say it, but like what God decrees and what God permits? Sure. His secret his secret, secret will and his, his revealed will, yeah. Here's a freaky one. How about this? In, in later on in the book of Acts, there, this whole thing about the uh, – the ship being carried along yeah. and they're right. And at one point Paul gets a, gets a word from the Lord, right? And he turns to the satyrs and stuff and he says, Hey, God has revealed to me that no life is going to be lost. It's like, wow. Okay. you take that as like, boom, that's it. And then here, you know, a day or two later, um, the sailors are trying to, <laughs> trying to get off, yeah. right? And escape. And Paul goes to the, to the uh, centurion, whoever it was in charge. And he says, if you don't cut these boats away, we, life will be lost. So you need to do your part. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, that's interesting, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you get this attention. this sovereign word from God, and yet there's a there's this there's this uh, action placed on men on these people. Right. Like, like you need to take care of business, right? It's like, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, even we'll, the we'll cross, it, yeah. the, the the way that they the apostles talk about it, the like Jesus is offered up and crucified according to the predetermined plan of God, mm-hmm. and yet man is completely one hundred percent fully responsible yeah. for their action. God's not responsible, and like in in evil and yet somehow it's according to his plan Mm -hmm. so like j.i packer talks about this phrase this word antinomy where there's two things that seem incompatible and yet they're not Mm -hmm. like in our in our human minds the way we think of things logically and put things together sometimes you run up and we're like those those seem completely incompatible but we're dealing with god who we don't fully understand and his will we don't fully understand like sometimes we have to live with these two things together and i think that that's like that idea of God's sovereignty and human will, that's a really tricky one. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, how much does God get and how much do we get? Is it like 50-50? Is it 80%, 20%? Uh, one of my professors in seminary gave a really interesting visual that helped me lean into this idea of antinomy. It doesn't answer the question of the how, but he's like, if you think about freedom, like God's freedom to do all things and human freedom, like sometimes we think it's like this big pie and you're cutting it to say, well, God gets like mm-hmm. you know three quarters of it and we get one quarter of it. He's like, that's not the way it works. It's like God has his pie where he does freely all things he wants. And man has a pie as well that God allows us to have. And somehow in God's mysterious will, those things work together. <laughs> and I'm like, I like that because it, it accounts for like the full responsibility of man and the fact that God, I think, is in control somehow of every jot and tittle. Mm-hmm. Whether it's permitting it or decreeing it, like we don't always... We don't always know. There are some things we know. God, God can't 
like do certain things because he's like my my character's not compatible with that, but he can mm-hmm. still be in control of it somehow. Yeah. Sorry, that's a, lot of, that's a weird assignment. I don't know how we got there, Dawson. <laughs> well, we're, it's, it was actually supposed to be a quick intro <laughs> so, to sorry. Acts chapter. I feel 10. like we opened up a can though for our listeners. Like it's well, it is, it, you know. And I, I would say, I, wait, sorry, before you keep moving on, I would say, if you haven't thought, if you're listening and you haven't thought deeply about this this uh, paradigm of uh, paradigm is the right word, whatever the uh, this thing, the two, these two things that don't seem compatible, yeah, these seeming tension, incompatibility. Yeah, tension, yeah, if you haven't thought about man's free will and God's sovereignty, spend some time thinking about it because I really do think it is it is worth thinking about. If nothing else, for your own benefit, but also for the benefit of non-believers. It is a question. It is a philosophical question that that other people are asking, and it would be it would do as well to to at least spend some time thinking. Yeah, about philosophical, it. but high, like super theological too. Mm-hmm. Meaning, like it, it it's wrapped up in who God is and who we are. And every, everything's him. theological, right? Yeah. Well, one of, one of the things, at least I think I've seen, is it at least in the Book of Acts, the fact that God is sovereign, <clears throat> sovereign, is a great source of comfort mm-hmm. and confidence for the believers. So part of the reason the <laughs> This question here was just to get us thinking about chapter 10. Oh, that's right. Where, yeah, you know, back to <laughs> there it is. Acts chapter 10. What book 10. are we in? Oh, there we go. Back okay. to what Acts. we preached last week. Well, one of the things we see over and over again in throughout the book of Acts, you see God's sovereign hand, you know, moving this person to go talk with this person, to go over here, you know, all the way from his evangelist going on out to what we're going to see here in, in chapter 10. And it's just marvelous, man, to, to have the joy of the Lord bringing somebody into your life at just the right time. Or you uh, moving into somebody else's life to minister to them, you know, exactly the right time. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, the Proverbs talk about, you know, you know, the right word at the right time is like, is like this choice thing. And so his sovereignty is meant to comfort and give us joy and give us confidence. Mm-hmm. So once again, if we if we bounce back here to um, to Cornelius, somebody wanna somebody wanna give us a quick um uh, somebody wanna give us a, just a quick overview of what's going on here in 10, 1 through 8, just so we kind of Everybody knows a little bit of what we're talking about. Well, in this room, the one person that is that preached this yesterday was <laughs> Brooks. So, Brooks, why don't you give us a little overview? Great Thanks. opportunity for Brooks to showcase <laughs> his your sovereignty of knowledge over this material. That's not, that's work. not true. Um, yeah, so uh, we have a we're focused right now in in the the Book of Acts. We're focused on Peter, and uh, uh, we take this little break for eight verses to really zero in on this man named Cornelius who we know nothing about just shows up which is kind of odd in just uh yeah just kind of shows up straight slap like straight in the middle of, of our right in the middle of our of our stories and so Cornelius Cornelius um a, a man of authority and he it, it says scripture says that he is a devout man who feared God with all of his household. So we can imagine his household has probably included his family, maybe his slaves, um, certainly the people that worked with him or for him. Um, and he was uh, a commander over a at, uh, upwards of 100 people, 100 soldiers. And uh, Cornel- Cornelius, devout man, feared God. And there's, so there's th- three things that, that is said about Cornelius. He's, he feared God, one. He gave generously and he prayed regularly. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, and the, the Lord speaks to him through an angel, shows up and says, hey, I want you to go get this guy, Peter, who's hanging out by the sea with a man who's a tanner. So that's what, that's what, that's, yeah. Who's Peter, right? Who's Peter? We'll yeah. find out, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you get this, you get this awesome preparation going on where this guy's heart, you know, it's like the soil of his heart is prepared, ready ready for the gospel, right? So he is a, he's called a god fear. So did, does this guy, Cornelius, um, so does he does he know the Lord at this point? What, 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 does he know the Lord? Is he, when the angel speaks to him, um, he'll hear the gospel here in a little bit. What do you guys think? There's, I could, I could, I guess you can go, probably go both ways on this thing. What do you guys? Yeah, think? we were going both ways over lunch today as we were talking about the podcast. We kind of pushed pause in the conversations and just decided to let press us, record let on, the, enjoy on the tape this yeah. conversation because I think we all fall maybe not slightly different in three places, different yeah. places, but yeah. at least two. So, well, why don't you start, Adam? And well, no, 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 take it. Take it. 
Well, no, because I'll jump in the middle there because I thought that would be the... You'll correct it. You'll be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'll just show you how to be the, <laughs> the negotiator just sits between the two. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. I'll start. Um, and maybe as we talk, like there's probably a lot of assumptions underneath what I'm going to say that that go into why I think this. But yeah, I would say he knows the Lord. Um, he's like, he, he's a Gentile, but be, because he's called a God-fearer, that is nomenclature for what, what was called a proselyte Jew, so someone who had come into contact with Judaism, the God of Israel, and sometimes even take on circumcision and become a Jew. We don't know if that was Cornelius, most likely not. But anyway, he's, he's a God-fearer. He's obedient. He's he's doing alms in Richland. We talked a couple weeks ago about Zedekah. Like he's, he's living the life of a Jew, even though he's not Jewish. And who he doesn't know yet is he doesn't know Jesus Christ who is the God of Israel incarnate. And so there's still there's still a part of his journey that's incomplete, just like mm -hmm. every Jew and Gentile, at least chronologically at this time in history. But up, you know, he's like every other Jew that came before Jesus in that he was worshiping the God of Israel, whose name is Yahweh, living with him. Uh, God fearing is another form, like it's it's like the equivalent of faith in the Old Testament when like people feared God, it was believing in Him and trusting Him and following Him, and so in every respect, in that case, Cornelius, yeah, he's a he's a faithful follower who will then meet Jesus through Peter, be baptized, receive the Spirit. But yeah, I would say given given how he's described here with the language, the fact that he prays and does alms, and the angel says that these have ascended before God as a memorial shows that he's not an unbeliever. He's not a, he's not like an outsider, but like his prayers and his gifts are actually something that God looks at. That's the language of sacrifice, right? Like the, the sacrifices ascend to God's throne and he smells them and he's satisfied. Like Cornelius, is, Cornelius's life is satisfying the God of Israel. So I'd say in that case, like how could you not see Cornelius as, is it a believer or a, what did you say? Uh, well, the believer, yeah, believer. Uh, regenerate. He's not a Christian yet because yeah. he has not yet met Christ. Yeah, but in the chronology of things, he's still he's in that tension space of like mm -hmm. Jews who who have a relationship with God, but don't not yet don't yet know Jesus, but he's about to. And that's the thing, like that's where the great tension <laughs> lies in kind of just the story of the gospel and in sovereign history of like. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what exactly in that in this period of of the mixing of the old covenant and the new covenant, where exactly like this guy's <clears throat> heart lands? Like, but the one thing I we do know is he needs Jesus. Yeah. Now he's going to get there, and that's partly why he's told to go talk to Peter. Right. This guy needs Jesus, and the one thing we say for sure is you're not satisfied without Jesus. For sure. Right. Like he needs that message, as as does everybody. And so, I mean, I, I would, so I guess I, maybe I misunderstood some of your position when we were talking earlier, because I would agree with all of that, right? Like, I think he's in full pursuit probably of God with what he has at the time. Right. And it, it seems to me almost like maybe God knows that, and he's leading him, he's yeah, leading him along with Yeah, I mean, so you'd put Peter. Cornelius, like, in the category of, like, an Old Testament saint, right? Like, an Old Testament person who, you know, Christ has not come on the scene yet, he has prophesied, but there are people who have faith Right, and the spirit is the spirit is at work in their life. Uh, yes, although there is now this new tension there of like, but now the new covenant has come, right? And so he has to find a faith. And and just you, you brought up the sovereignty thing, and I think this is just some of God's sovereign hand, where He knows that Cornelius is someone who will respond. Yeah, so yeah. he's going to get the opportunity to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> I would, I would agree with with you, Matthew, and and with. So, so we all agree. Yeah, we, we all agree. agree. But, okay. but, but the, well, the way that you put it, I think, or the, I, as you say, the way that Matthew summarized how you put it, um, he needs Jesus. That is, right. and I, I think we all would say yes and amen to that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I see him as a, yeah, he's on the right track, but he doesn't have all the tools. He's 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 uh, he wants to build something, but he doesn't have all the all the Legos in the box, right? So it's and and and, and why why I say that <clears throat> a, few, a few things is um, because he uh, he falls down in front of Peter later in chapter ten and starts worshiping Peter. Um, if he had a robust understanding of 
God, he wouldn't have done that. I don't think, right? So I'm going to challenge that because I heard okay. you say that earlier. Are you familiar with Revelation 22? Yes. The apostle John does the same thing to the angel. Huh. And the angel says like, stand up. Stand up. Okay. Yeah. Like it's, it's. He was just mi- misreading. Yeah. Like the misreading the divine encounter. Mm-hmm. I mean, John in Revelation 1 encounters like the glorified risen Jesus and he falls down yeah. as though dead. And Jesus puts his hand on him and says like, fear not. But at the end, like John falls down at an angel because of like overcome by the divine encounter, but responds and stands back up. So yeah. I think with, yeah. I don't know that you can make a case to say like he's a pagan or he doesn't have all the tools because he he fell down for an angel because mm-hmm. I mean, John was... John was Jesus' beloved disciple. Well, he didn't fall down for an angel. He fell down for Peter. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. He, for when Peter. He, when he meets gotcha, Peter, he says gotcha. he fell on his feet and worships gotcha, him. Gotcha, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's Later it. Later on, yeah. Yeah, verse 25. Yeah. Peter entered, kingdom of man and fell down. Yeah, so, um, and there there seems to be something, like he seems to know that he's missing pieces. Right. Um, because he, <clears throat> we get a, uh, when, when the angel comes to meet Cornelius, uh, we get one snippet of what the angel said to, to Cornelius. And then there seems to be some missing pieces because of that conversation, because later in verse 33 of chapter 10, after Peter has been brought, brought from Joppa to the house of Cornelius, he says, uh, this is Cornelius talking. He says, so I sent for you at once and you have been kind enough to come. Uh, that's very nice words. He says, <laughs> <laughs> now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. Mm-hmm. So he seems to know, seems to recognize that there's like, hey, I'm missing a piece here. So I would say, yeah, right. Cornelius is certainly on the right track. And that's what's super fascinating to me because I, I want to zoom out and say, are there other people in our lives that seem to be on the right track, but they're missing pieces? Like, man, you you maybe have a healthy understanding of God. You might even fear God, but you do not know Jesus, you don't have all the pieces in the box and I can tell, I can, I can finish the puzzle for you. I can, I can tell you where you're, where you're missing. Um, and he talking about sovereignty. I love what you said, Matthew, of God's hand knows that or God in God's sovereignty, he knows that Cornelius is going to respond. So, so he's going to bring, he's going to bring the gospel message to Cornelius. It's almost like, you know, you hear of Muslim seekers of God yes. who are dissatisfied with what's, what's going on. And then God in his sovereignty will give them uh, dreams, visions, yes. have, send them to certain people so that they can hear the gospel. If I could jump in, what, what about this? So if Cornelius, who you, you think was regenerate, right? Yeah, still, needs, Adam, still needs a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. But yeah, has but has, has a genuine faith in the faith God of Israel in what he knows. Okay, yeah. So I wonder if we could say, what if we say, if Cornelius had rejected Christ right here, mm-hmm. I wonder if that would have been a sign that you know his faith was really not genuine. Sure, like oh, he was absolutely. like a he was a mm, some kind of God fearer, but in a general sense, you know, just sort of a respecter of the divine of the divine. But right. we see that his faith is genuine because once once the gospel is is told to him, he immediately embraces embraces Christ yeah. and probably has faith in Christ right then, right? He didn't stop and like pray a prayer. Excuse me, I, I accept mm-hmm. Jesus as my savior. <laughs> it's like just as he's listening to the message, boom, you know, the spirit falls That's on what it him. Says. Because whole, his yeah, the faith, spirit falls on all those Gentiles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think I think right in their hearts, it's like in their minds, they had they had faith. They embraced this and boom, Spirit of God came in. Prepared them, and the spirit of God came into them, which is yeah. a great sidebar. Like you know, I mean, just because and this is a total sidebar, but it's yeah. not the prayer that like saves people. Sometimes they think that, but like mm-hmm. it yeah. is the faith oh, come on. Response. response, right? Like, yeah. yeah. And if if you're relying on a prayer that you said years ago, like that's not where you want to be, right? Yeah. Like, and it will take action in your life, yeah. Yeah. and the Holy Spirit will be active in your life if it is true faith. Yeah. Respond My uh, to Jesus. brother-in-law, this is years ago, was seeking seeking the Lord. And he's really intellectual and he's calling me up all the time. Just, it's actually, frankly, kind of annoy, annoying. <laughs> anyway, he calls me up one day and I answer the phone, right? And he starts asking all these questions about Christ and stuff. And I'm just like, okay, I'm, I was kind of used to it. But then at one point he goes, I kid you not, he just stops. He goes, oh, wait, wait, wait. So ac- Jesus actually died for me. Hmm. It's like he made this hmm. jump not where Jesus died for like humanity, did this good work. He got it. Christ died for me. Mm-hmm. And I like right then, all of a sudden I wasn't annoyed anymore. I was like, oh my gosh. I think he was just, I think he actually just expressed faith. Mm-hmm. So I think he was, I think the spirit of God, he was regenerate in that moment. 
right? I mean, I, I, to be straight up with you, I think we did the prayer thing later because I was like, well, better make sure. Make sure it's official. <laughs> you know, just make sure. <laughs> cross those T's, dot cross those I's. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Make this thing legal. Yeah. But I, like, seriously, I just knew, oh my gosh, this guy's faith has just saved him. Yeah. 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 So my, my intent with this point is not to say that yeah. people don't need to know Jesus. They do. Yeah. Um, my concern you is- You just want to make that abundantly clear, right? Yes. That Jesus is a big deal. To okay. me, what we think about Cornelius <laughs> at this point in time has a lot to say about what we what we encounter when we <coughs> read the Old Testament. For people who lived in relationship with God for thousands of years, all of these people in the Old Testament that are presented to us as both pointing to Christ, but also pointing to what it means to follow Christ, who- in the mystery of God before he comes in the flesh, like they know him and they relate to him. And so to say that Cornelius isn't, isn't saved yet because he doesn't know about Jesus in this moment where Jesus is relatively new, it's different to say that today, right? Is I think to make a judgment on how you read how God worked with his people before God came in the flesh. So but like for Cornelius though, as, as you just mentioned there, right? Like, so if he doesn't believe in Jesus, though, then he, you would say he's not saved. Oh yeah, like he's re, he's rejecting Jesus right. for sure. But like at this but, but point he, in time, even, yeah, right. But like, like the fact that no his Peter prayers, that, right? Like, yeah, but the fact that his prayers ascended to God as a memorial. Yeah. It's not just mm-hmm. as some attempt, but like that word memorial is the same one. Like do this in, in memory of me, like the the Lord's Supper. It's like it's coming before God as a memorial to Him. God's noticing it, He's seeing it, and He's even remembering possibly mm. His relationship with Cornelius. So that to me, it's. It's awkward to say, but to me, it makes a large difference about how you read about people who followed the Lord before Jesus. So it's less about like what, what it needs to look like now and more about what does that say about before Jesus came and how God worked with his people and how we should read the Old Testament scriptures that like people were saved by God through the work of Christ before Christ came. Hmm. And it looked different than it does now. I mean, I would, that's, I, I love that you look at it that way. Um, totally disagree. <laughs> no, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I just I think it's great that <clears throat> that we'd look at it a little bit differently because I would look at it as a, almost like a warning to to lukewarm Christians hmm. of say, hey, j- just living a mediocre life that that gives a little and or going to church. And- yeah, like mm-hmm. if you do not have a relationship with God with Jesus, mm-hmm. if you don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. You're just like Cornelius before Peter comes from Joppa. Hmm. Right. And can I be like Peter and show you, you yes. know, and help you discover Jesus for yourself? Yeah. yeah. And then <coughs> as well, bless you, Dave, um, as Sorry. well, uh, yeah, like I had mentioned before, and I just want to think of the people that that have not yet responded to the gospel because they, they might be on the right track, but they don't have all the pieces. Or a lot of people outside of Christianity. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who have some sense of faith, but they have not yet met Jesus Mm -hmm. and and, like they Mm -hmm. need Jesus. Like that's just all it comes down to. And I love what you had said earlier too about like, and there's that call there where like in God's sovereignty, how he kind of leads those conversations Mm -hmm. for us to wrestle with. Does God call me to be Peter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like do I need to be Peter to some people who like, maybe they're they're, they're doing what they honestly can with what they've got, Mm -hmm. but they don't have all the tools (laughs) Mm -hmm. because they don't have the gospel. And like they need, us to be Peter and bring that yeah. to him. And I think guys, I would go ahead. I think because I agree with everything you're saying, but the way I read this is the emphasis is more on the faithfulness of God to Cornelius mm-hmm. than on yeah. Cornelius's response of faith to God. It's like you're a God fearer, and Jesus. It like if you keep reading, it's like God did this. God sent Jesus. God like yeah. God's the God that Cornelius worships and is now going to bring the gospel mm-hmm. to Cornelius. It's not saying that he does respond to faith, and we should think about that. But to me, the emphasis is on the power of and the faithfulness of God to chase after the people that were following him. Oh, I, I, I like agree. That, to that, me, that, is the that, there's the emphasis there of like, yeah, like he's going to become a believer because God directly sends an angel to him. Yeah, he's already got Peter set up to do this. He's going to give Peter a vision. Yeah, like, like Cornelius. No doubt, yeah, you've been following me, and I've done this new thing. And now I'm going to come to you and tell you so you can know. Right, because he knows that I love you and you love happening. me. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. If we That's... could, um, our time is just about out, you guys. So, no, it was a very good conversation. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. If we could, no, you guys are good, man. You guys <laughs> that are first after. question you asked us earlier. I know. Well, That's, could, that's where all the time went. <laughs> <laughs> so if we could wrap this in and it's like, okay, what what is a takeaway? Like we, we'd start off talking about God's sovereignty and we, 
you know, we kind of noted that this is supposed to be not a, a downer sovereignty, like you were saying, Brooks, but it's, it is meant to be a motivation and inspiration and a, yep. and a confidence builder for us. Mm. If you, if you could get, give one takeaway just from our conversation today for people that would, to inspire them to some, this, this, this should issue in some kind of practical thing in their lives. What would you, boom, would you say? We could couple the couple. Can, can I give two? Yes, you can. Please. So, so one, are awesome. one thing right. that just tying in that sovereignty thing and then go just kind of piggyback on what Adam was saying. If you're a believer, just take great comfort in the fact that God pursued you. Mm-hmm. Like, isn't that amazing? Like, let us rejoice in that, that we have a sovereign God who loved you and pursued you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, but then again, this, I would come back to that second point too of like, God and his sovereignty uses people. Yeah, yeah, for sure. People like Peter, yep. people like you and me. Yeah to bring his gospel to people yeah, and just discovering what is our role in that. Yeah. I, that's not that's great. I would add a third one here is because God's sovereign, like that should give us more desire and joy in praying to him because we, mm. we may be small and we feel like the things that we are offering up sometimes are insignificant, but God saw and responded to the prayers of this man who didn't even know Jesus yet. And yet it's, it's ascending to his throne. Like your prayers, um, God sees them, God hears them mm-hmm. and God cares about them. <clears throat> and like his sovereignty proves to us that we can pray to him and know that he can handle it. Like yeah. he can, he can handle all the voices coming at him at once. Unlike we can, like we can't do that. Yeah. My, my takeaway would be this very similar to Adam's is I, uh, for as, for as much as the, our conversation was just about it. Yeah. As Cornelius Regenerate or not, I, I, would, yeah, yeah. I, I would speculating. Yeah, I would say I would speak to the believer who has been faithful in living like Christ, faithful in being a part of the fellowship of, of believers, faithful in giving, faithful in serving, faithful in praying. Um, that God sees you, uh, even when you don't maybe think or feel like God sees you. Hmm. God sees you. Yeah, good. I'll go ahead and add one. I think we find ourselves in a situation where we're trying to share with somebody or they actually ask us something or whatever, we don't know how God's been preparing that person, right? Like some, you try to read faces, you try to read this or that, but really we don't know. Mm-hmm. And um, like Peter wouldn't even going to go into the house simply because this is a Gentile. So the right. Lord told him, look, you can't, you can't be like mm-hmm. that, man. I'm, I'm accepting all people. So I think what a great joy, what a, what a confidence builder for us is like, we don't know, since we aren't God, we can't read everything in the moment. Mm. How do we know God has not done this fantastic job of just preparing somebody for, for just such a moment as, as, yep. as our talking with them? Yeah. So that's a good, good word. Well, guys, uh, really good. Thank you for the discussion. Hey, we kind of got uh, the whole thing about the deeper dive is to go deeper into some aspect of the previous week's uh, uh, sermon. And I think we did that today. So this has been a wonderful book. And thank you guys for your great conversation. Once again, this is the ministry of uh, Bethel Church in uh, Richland, Washington. If you want to check us out, yeah, go a little further, a little deeper dive into our church. You can go to Bethel.ch. Richland, Prosser, and Pasco. Brooks, looked, he looked at you like, don't, don't forget about us. Yes. <laughs> We're all in this One together. church, three, three locations. locations. <laughs>